Welcome to the Enlightenment Evolution Hour. I am your host, Rob Gothier, the ET Whisperer. The Enlightenment Evolution Hour is a part of the Enlightenment Evolution Network. Any ideas expressed by the guest, myself, or commenters may not necessarily reflect the same opinions of the Enlightenment Evolution Network. Enlightenment defined. It is the state of giving or receiving greater knowledge and understanding about a certain subject or situation. Evolution defined. The gradual development of something, especially from a simple to more complex form. So what is enlightenment evolution? The state of giving and receiving greater knowledge as we develop from a simple to more complex human being living on earth for our soul's experience. Welcome now and join us as we explore our Enlightenment Evolution Hour together. The Enlightenment Evolution Hour is simulcast live every Wednesday at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific from the Enlightenment Evolution Hour page, Matrix Minds Facebook page, and the ET Whisper YouTube channel. It is also redistributed from the Forbidden Knowledge News Network and Conscious Awakening Network. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Enlightenment Evolution Hour. I am your host, Rob Gothier. We have a wonderful, amazing guest coming today. Uh, a lot of you guys know him, uh, William Stone. We'll talk a little bit more about him in just a minute. We got to do announcements first. First of all, I want to say hello to all of you in the Matrix Minds, my brainiacs. Hello. Welcome, welcome. I want to say all of you guys on the ET Whisper uh, YouTube page, hello, and all of you from the Enlightenment Evolution Hour Facebook page, hello. Welcome with us live, and welcome to all who are listening afterwards to the many places that it's distributed. We have some announcements coming up. Now, first of all, I do want to let you guys know, next week we are going to have Oriah Mirza coming in. Uh, she was slated to do a few weeks back and had to move the schedule around, but she is going to be here on the 6th. Her husband, Riz, was on just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, he was a great guy. So she's going to be here with some amazing topics to talk about, amazing stuff to share. After that, on the 13th, we have Art Geyser. Uh, the week after that, I will be in Sedona, Arizona to my event, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I will have a pre-recorded show, and we're going to have the one and only C.M. Kozeman uh, coming back with us. And C.M. Kozeman already did a show with me earlier. He is the author of All Tomorrows, um, a myriad of the billion-year history of humans or something to the effect of that. If you look up All Tomorrows, uh, it's a viral book about uh, the human race and its evolution in, in many directions in the future as a speculative evolution, which is great. And even more amazing, one of the people that he mentioned as one of his heroes, one of the people that he printed out every art that he could get from this guy and put in a book when he was younger, and it's still one of his most treasured possessions, we're going to have David Chase on on the 27th, which is going to be amazing. Uh, I did it one with him many years ago. He's an ET artist. Uh, he is a UFO researcher, and he is also a futurist, an amazing guy. He'll be here uh, on the 27th of September. And then uh, October 4th, we're going to have uh, Ismael Perez. Uh, and that's going to be an amazing thing. We'll let you guys know who the guests are coming as they come forward. Uh, so past that, let's go to the uh, network announcements. We still have Out There Talk with Valiant himself, which is every... Wednesday and Thursday, and that is a Instagram live show, and that is an amazing one. If you go to at out there talk, you'll find the page. Myself and Kalina have been guests on a show before. Really amazing stuff. Uh, really great guy. He explores all things that are out there, and uh, the hiatus for the mothership will continue because my good friend uh, since childhood, another William, not the William from tonight. Uh, he is just two days after a massive bag surgery, so he's got a little while to recover. Sending lots of love to him. Now, the ET Whisper announcements are pretty quick. Um, we only have to talk about the Arizona event that's going to be happening, and that's going to be, uh, pardon me as I adjust my calendar, that's going to be 
uh, this coming uh, couple of weeks. We're going to have it from September 20th, uh, pardon me, 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, a three-day uh, Transcendence Retreat. If you go to SedonaTranscendentRetreat.com, you can buy tickets. The VIP will get you time with myself and Ruben doing CE5s for two nights. And you can choose which presenter you want, but there's entry-level fee where you just say, hey, I just want to show up and, and my, my higher self, my guides, whatever, will kind of show me the path. Uh, and you don't care who it is that you're visiting or seeing. You can just buy that or you can add on to preferential fees so you can choose your, your times. Uh, all of that set up at SedonaTranscendenceRetreat.com. So check that out. Uh, and it is on the website, etwhisper.com. Uh, but that's about it. So tonight, I want to talk about my guest. Many of you who experienced the Patreon experience with us know William well. He's been with us now uh, doing the show for a little over three years, coming close to four, I imagine, because he took over uh, for Kalina um, for about the times uh, Lilith was about six to eight months, maybe nine months. So it's been almost, you know, three and a half years or so. Um, he's been doing those Patreons with us quite regularly, but he is more than just an ET Whisper Patreon person. He's also uh, very connected to Fincastle Underground, which is all things underground. Um, he's had YouTube channels. He's had media companies. This guy is a jack of all trades type of guy. And I think instead of sharing what it is uh, that I know about him, why don't we have him come in and, and share himself? William, hello, brother. How are you? This means that you misplaced my biography, isn't it? Isn't that where you're going with this? <laughs> yeah, you know, I didn't even put one on the first show. I went to and paste and <laughs> it was not. No, there. it's fine. It's totally fine. It's um, I'm having a wonderful evening, actually. It's always a wonderful reversal to be on. I mean, I'm sitting in the same chair I do when I host your show, but it's I'm on the other side of the microphone, so to speak, uh, with you as the interviewer. It's it's quite the the nice change. Yeah, usually you get to interview the extra dimensional beings or the the extraterrestrial consciousnesses that I channel when doing Patreon, and now you get the interview seat. That's nice. It is actually. Um, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about why I do these shows with you because, you know, sometimes it's it's chaotic. Like tonight we had to move around Patreon. I've got a place to be at four o'clock in the morning. And no matter what's going on in my life, I will always drop what I'm doing to be a part of the ET Whisperer show. And I was actually just gestating about this this morning. And I'm like, you know, it's really because Rob's my friend, basically. Talking to the aliens, although a nice resume bullet, is actually separate to the fact that literally the, the, this is the only time that you and I ever really get to talk to each other because your life is so hectic and your, my life is so hectic. So basically just by hosting your show, it's it's kind of like a personal uh, phone call. It's the only time I get to talk to you twice a month, basically. Yeah, it's the only guaranteed time we get on. And why? Uh, we'll, we'll get into why your life might be a little hectic. But first, I want you to ask uh, answer a question that I never got a chance to ask you because I came up with this question after our show. You were the very first guest on. Um, on my return to the Enlightenment Evolution Hour. Um, how long ago question, was that? Do you remember how long over ago Over a year. Was? I just saw okay. a year come up on the thing uh, on my Facebook like two months ago. So it's been almost uh, 14 months. All right. Just curious. Believe it or not, right? I, yeah. I, I have to believe it. Time is is doing fourth density things these days. So It, it is. And and that's, that's why I want to ask this question because it's not a question that a lot of people ask, but... You know, yes, we know your story from the last interview, and we'll, we'll touch a little bit on that this time. But what about before your story? What was the things that shaped your life to be the William who was interested in broadcasting, who was interested in human rights uh, activism, who was uh, a person who was open to sociology and all the other things uh, that you've done? What, what, How did the world shape you? What influences were there as a kid? Oh, God. I mean, you can't separate. Um, you know, again, this is timely because I was watching a, a drama show from the 1950s called Naked City. It's a gritty detective drama about New York. And the narrator asked the question, is it the people that make the city or is it the city that makes the people? And anytime I reflect back on my life, I cannot extract myself from the fact that I was a New Yorker experienced the full New York experience all throughout the 80s and 90s in my early childhood and, and early teenage years. 
And the things that I saw there, you know, I can't really say what influenced me. When it comes to broadcasting, I have a very distinct memory of uh, my grandparents were very old fashioned, being that they were born in the early 1900s, and we would always have Sundays together. And after breakfast and everything, once everything was handled, they'd be listening to the AM radio. And on one of those occasions, my grandfather showed me how you could record your own voice onto a cassette tape on his boombox that he had there. And after I was just captivated after that. You know, it never occurred to me. I mean, I had to have been maybe five or six years old. Maybe, tops. And it never occurred to me that uh, you could put yourself on tape. I had not conceptualized. I hadn't even asked the question, like, where do tapes come from? How do people get their voices on it? Any of that stuff. I hadn't even conceptualized any of that. And he shows me how to do it. So it was just, it was like a, a hack, I guess they'd call it today. Well, that's the 1980s, you know, um, when you're a child. Uh, we grew up around the same time. Early 80s uh, was our young childhood. The late 80s was our a little older childhood and we got to be teens in the 90s uh and it was a different time and this is pre-internet and this was um uh during new york's one of the the peak times of new york city in history uh the 80s were iconic in, in new york um so i can imagine the influences uh i know last time we talked you did talk a little bit about the morning radio shows and how that kind of played a part in your understanding of, of the concept too Yes, because New York has some very – New York and radio go hand in hand, essentially. New York has some very famous radio. I don't want to belittle the other parts of the country. New York is – it's such a pioneer in everything, and radio is no exception. You know, like, you know how they have uh, – if you listen to a morning DJs now, which I can't stand these days – It'll be like seven or eight people in a room and it's all like wacky personalities playing off of each other. And they're basically very two dimensional characters. Well, that was essentially pioneered in New York and Z100 in, with the Z Morning Zoo. They're the ones that really started that format, you know, get, getting a bunch of wacky people into the room and having people call up and do prank phone calls. And it fascinated me because it was interactive. And then later on in my teenage years at this point, if I had stayed in New York, I wouldn't have gotten a driver's license until I was 18 and probably never even because that was the law up there. Down in Virginia, though, you could get a learner's permit when you're 15 years old because you might <laughs> need it for the farm. <laughs> so by the time I'm 16, I'm driving around in like these old luxury cars from the 70s, like just these outrageous, you know, and hanging out with guys. We just working on our cars. It was almost like being a 50s greaser, actually, because Virginia was still so rural in the mid 90s compared to New York. I know I'm kind of meandering. I'm, I, I, this is a way of getting at your question. Um, so we're working on these cars all the time. And we, what would you do after you worked on your classic luxury car and you were paying 82 cents a gallon for gas legitimately is what I was paying at the time? Well, we go cruising. And like American Graffiti style, if anybody is familiar with that movie, not everybody, but most people would listen to one or two radio stations in the Roanoke Valley at the time, usually K92 or 96.3 or something like that. And so what the effect of that was that every person cruising became a speaker for this for the radio station. So we were all tuned into the same radio station, essentially, you know, so that the people in the cars next to you were listening to the same thing. And it fascinated me how that unified everyone. I wouldn't really realize it until later. Now everyone can have their own private radio station. You know, you got Pandora or YouTube Music or Spotify or something like that. You create whatever music you want to listen to. At the time, though, you had to listen to whatever was on the air. And, you know, so you'd be cruising with people and you could find people on the street that if they were listening to your radio station, well, you knew they were good people because they were driving a classic car and they listened to the same radio as you did. And I think... Also, as a collective, it, it was uniting people more. We were all in the same frequency. And if there was a girl you liked, what do you do? You call the radio station. You're like, hey, I want to dedicate this song. Uh, this song's for Amanda out there. I want you to you know, to play this, and I want you to let her know that I have a crush on her or something like that. And, and now, <laughs> nowadays, it's like uh, you can barely get a couple thousand people in the same live streams uh, to, to communicate and connect. But everyone was listening. You're right. That's, that's right. crazy. Right. So at the time, I remember it being fascinating to me at the time because I'm like, wow, we've got the ultimate sound system. Every single car out here is a speaker playing the same music, you know, in the same commercials, of course, but basically the same music. 
And I, I recently thought about that is because now I don't listen to terrestrial radio anymore. Very, very rarely will I have the radio on in the car because now broadcasting has become so personalized. I, I can select the music that I like. Um, I do explore new stuff so it doesn't get stale. I definitely don't listen to advertising in my life anymore because I think that that also takes um, on the topic of broadcasting, you know, Robert Monroe, as you know, from the Monroe Institute, he did a lot of work with sound and frequency. And this is one of the, this has been one of the great problems with radio and television, the things they pump into your home, using those same types of frequencies to alter your consciousness and make you susceptible to messaging or political bias or what have you. You know, so I steer clear of, of any broadcasting today, ironically. Now I'm sort of the anti-broadcaster. I don't even have a television in my home anymore. Yeah, well, it's it's crazy, too. You're right. These uh, advertisements, they were so prevalent and they worked really well uh, back in the 80s, 90s, because there wasn't another option. If you wanted to see your show, you had to mm. sit through the commercial. If you wanted to listen to your favorite radio station, you had to. And now we have the power. Well, some apps you have to pay for a couple bucks uh, here or there, but yeah. you can skip all that now and, and do what you like. But uh, so so I know with you, you love technology and there's an aspect of it that that's frustrating for you, too. But what do you think of this? Uh, the Internet change? How do you think that that really changed? Because you're a sociologist, too. Uh, you studied humanity and behaviors in humanity so tell me a little bit about how you feel of the internet way of hitting earth and, and what it did both in good and bad terms for us well i say i got my doctorate in sociology just by living in new york the degree later was a formality <laughs> no doubt <laughs> you know you ride ride the the long island railroad for a couple hours in the 1980s and see what you learn about people um the, yeah, internet... the warriors that that's the whole movie <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's um, – I don't know. This is all something that's very – and I, I, I think that people in the collective out there, those of you ladies and gentlemen in the listening audience, maybe have gone through some of these stages yourself. You know, this is really only applicable if you're, you know, maybe 35 years old or older. If you're younger than 35, the internet has been – present in your life in some way, even if you weren't a user. Rob and I and some of the people younger than us of the last few generations that the we were untouched by the internet in childhood. Just It just wasn't there. It wasn't, um, we've talked about this before on your other shows. The way, Rob, the way that you and I grew up now, we're in our early 40s, is not vastly different than the way our parents would have grown up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know, by and large. Yes, we had our Taris and, and, and VCRs and things like that. However, we still had the same telephone type technology. If you wanted to send something, you'd have to send it through the postal service or you're paying for long distance phone calls or, you know, it's, so that's, that's 35 years. That's a generation right there between uh, Generation X, our generation and the baby boomers. There was not a vastly different childhood, really, you know, compared to a child growing up today where everything's technology, uh, it, the screens are ever present. The, the broadcasting is incessant. It never, it never ends. You're bombarded with these frequencies. And I don't want to sound literally like a tinfoil hat wearer where I'm like, Oh, all these horrible frequencies. But yes, there is something to be said for uh, inviting this much electromagnetic energy into your life constantly on an ongoing basis. I always make this analogy for people where I live out, I live out in Appalachia in Fincastle, Virginia right now. The power goes out with some regularity. It's usually back on in an hour or so. Every time the power goes out, and see if you ladies and gentlemen out there notice this, every time the power goes out, it's instant calm. It's like a weight is taken, for me anyway. I guess if you're afraid of the dark, it's a whole other experience. As soon as I hear there's no more refrigerator running, there's none of the the, the vampire devices that are plugged in but never switched on. As soon as the power is dead for the neighborhood, it's just a, an instant equanimity, an instant relaxation. So, yes, there is something to be said for having this stuff present in your life all the time. How do you feel since you've gotten rid of your Internet and your TVs uh, at home? Well, I don't mean to be deceptive. Obviously, I still have a cell phone. Uh, and I still do work. On, I'm in sort of the finance industry. I run an ATM corporation. I have private ATMs all over the state of Virginia. 
and so it's it's necessary for me. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to claim to be a purist the way I, you know, so I still have, if I need to get on the internet, obviously I have a cell phone. If I need to broadcast with the ET whisperer, I have a separate building, you know, where I have a computer set up. Otherwise we couldn't be doing this right now. You know, at my home, it's a noticeable difference. It is a noticeable difference. Not having the Wi-Fi broadcasting, not have the television. I do have actually a wooden television from 1980 in my home. However, <laughs> my it's only to keep my Nintendo and Super Nintendo hooked up to, which I rarely play anymore if I'm in the if the mood strikes me. It's more of an aesthetic thing. But interestingly enough on that, Rob and anyone out there, if you've got an old tube television, if you turn that thing on, you can definitely feel it. My daughter, uh, who's 20 years old now, she grew up with them around there too, but she she's I think particularly sensitive to it because she's younger. They say you lose some of your hearing range as you get older. Don't know how true that is or if you even want to believe that reality. Uh, but when I turn it on, she's always like, can't you hear that? Like, you just can't hear that buzzing. And I'm like, I can kind of hear something and you can definitely feel it. The There's definitely an energy coming off the tube. I don't know if anybody's old enough. You remember licking those when you were a kid. <laughs> Wait, I, I cringe to think about it. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever licked a vacuum tube, but I, I remember the sounds they would make on the TV when you turn them on. It's like, <laughs> like right. that. And, yeah. And now a television from 1980 is so out of the ordinary you know, back then you just turn it on. Well, this is what a TV does. Well, now, 40 years later, you turn it on. You're like, my God, how did people ever let these in their home? And I think people will say the same thing about some of the technology we have now. I'm very suspect of the devices that we carry, you know, just keeping them so close to us all the time. Uh, I'm becoming very sensitive. As, as I'm more in touch with the earth, I'm becoming more intolerant of even having my phone like near me. Like it feels like it burns my fingertips when I even touch the touch screen sometimes. I know it sounds, it sounds like a paranoid now. It's just that I live a vast majority of my life literally in the forest. You know, we're surrounded by the Appalachian Mountains. It's it's fairly, fairly rural. And so as I've as I've removed it from my life more and more, when I go back to it, the effect is, you know, more intolerable. Uh, so let's let's talk about uh, the William after you you kind of formed yourself. I know uh, you did a lot of things um, in your history. And we talked about a lot of those things uh, on the first show, but um, talk to us about the metaphysical aspects of your life, your, your entrance into that, your introduction, and kind of how that's affected you. Because most of the time we're talking now, we're talking about channeling metaphysics uh creation all of these types of things right and that's very and that that will probably be i can't imagine that ever changing you know i can't imagine like i'm just going to abandon metaphysics and return to catholicism for instance you know because me there's been nothing like metaphysics that has really made me the captain of my own life which is the message I get from any quality metaphysical teacher, including yourself, Treb, Ardiff, uh, the Pleiadians as channeled by various people, Bashar, any, any of this metaphysical stuff, that's my litmus test is like, is it looking to absolve you of your own responsibility or is it looking to put you in charge of your own life? And, you know, now even when unpleasant things happen in my life, I'm willing to take responsibility for them. And it's a whole different way of viewing the world. And none of this could have ever happened to me if my uncle hadn't died in 2004. This was the catalyst to that. Uh, it was 2004. I would have been 23 years old. And my uncle dies, we we'll say suddenly, but not really suddenly. He abused his body like he was horribly overweight and was on so many different prescription drugs, all of which had conflicting applications. He had turned his entire trust over to the medical community and essentially exactly what I'm talking about. He, he, rather than take responsibility for his own health and his own life choices, he trusted the medical community to do it. Well, they had him so, we we're cleaning out his apartment. He, they had him so hopped up on pills, pills that conflict with each other. They have completely different applications. And I'm like, that, that's really what did him in. And I was kind of chunkier myself at the time. So that was kind of a wake up call for me on one level, on the physical level. I'm like, you know, I need to get back in the shape I was when I was in the Air Force. And so there was that. So I started at that time looking into health. It took me down the road of veganism, which I no longer am. 
so, but I was, I was reevaluating all my beliefs at the time is the point. And, and food was just one of those. I became very sickly as a vegan, you know, but it was a, an important experimental phase in my life. Cause up until that, I hadn't even considered, I didn't think about the things I was putting in my body. You know, I, it was, it was a disconnect for me. Like, Oh, it's a hamburger. Well, later I'm like, well, no, it's actually a cow, you, you know, and there's a whole food chain behind it. It doesn't just come in a little paper bag. I was very naive about these things. You know, I mean, of course, I knew hamburgers came from cows, but it, it was a cognitive dissonance. You don't think about those things. Right. Well, and most it, people don't through their dietary needs until it affects their health or, or something else environmentally. Sure. Right. Or kills Uncle Frank. And so <laughs> that's indeed Uncle Frank dies. My mother turns to a psychic and I don't remember the lady's name. Uh, but as my mother's talking to a psychic, to, which I thought was very odd for my mother to do such a thing because she was a very strong Catholic at the time. Uh, so she turns to a psychic and the psychic mentions to her, if anyone has a chance of contacting Uncle Frank, it's really your son, William, which is me, of course. I had no idea about this. I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was necessarily had any psychic leanings at the time. I did have an abduction experience when I was a young, when I was a young child. Uh, ongoing actually, but it did not cross over into the world of being a psychic. You know, of course I thought about psychic powers very differently back then. I didn't, you know, back then a psychic, psychic, psychic someone with psychic powers, it was like a, uh, like a random thing. Yeah. I didn't you were realize, born gifted with it. Yeah. Right. You know, you just have it or you don't have it. I didn't realize you can, uh, you can attune these things. You can use your mental acuity to tune these things more, you know, you can become sensitive to things, be more aware of the earth you're living on, uh, practice lucid dreaming, learn how to channel. None of that was on the radar for me. So this lady tells my mother, William would have the best chance of contacting uncle Frank. So they book a session with me to talk to the psychic. And I don't even remember the substance of what was said, except for she recommended this book for me called Seth speaks, which, you know, is by Jane Roberts. I'd be, if there's anyone listening to me tonight that hears the sound of my voice and you don't know the Seth material by Jane Roberts, you are wrong. <laughs> you know? yeah, it's no. a, a highly recommended from myself, uh, from Daryl Anka, from uh, I think it was Wendy Kale. A bunch of the channelers we've had on here have talked. I don't about know anyone Seth. who wouldn't recommend it, actually. That's right. Right. You're not wrong. My drill instructor used to say that, but you know, it's. I, it, it would be actually unbelievable to me if you've been listening to the E.T. Whisper and you don't know about Jane Roberts. She was the, it does not get enough credit, somehow is not, and despite doing the channeling work that she did, was also a prolific author of her own, uh, wrote numerous books on poetry, many of which I own, wrote a children's book, which I also own and have read. And uh, I don't know that she's on any college reading list, actually. You know, but she is so. But if you're in this world and you don't know about Jane Roberts, that would be very surprising to me, is the point. Uh, but I was off to the races after starting to read Seth Speaks. I went doing that, that was, and about the same time, I stumbled across The Secret. I think it was a few years later. It was this weird time in life where, like, there wasn't really Netflix or the internet as you know now. So people were like passing around DVDs that they had burned at parties. I don't know if I'm just admitting to like massive piracy here, but there was a period of time in like the 2005, six, seven and eight. I remember like it was a thing that people would go, yo, check out this documentary on nine 11, check out this documentary on uh, creating reality. Look at this thing on UFOs. And that's how, you know, cause again, the internet wasn't in what it is now, you know, it wasn't, you weren't finding stuff like that on online unless you were downloading it from someplace like, LimeWire or Kazaa or something like that. Yeah, I don't even think YouTube came out till 2008, but it wasn't prolific and available to people till 2010. -ish, no, it was two, it was 2005, but it was it wasn't what it is now. Certainly not by a long shot. No, you could do like 30 second clips for the first three years it was up. I think it was very low standard. You had to put a lot of uh, computing power and memory power to to be able to even upload a video on it. Right. And then at the time, not everyone had a computer that could play video because they were still, you know, they're still using dial. This is, it goes back to, you know, to tie everything together. When you asked me earlier about broadcasting and technology and how I feel about all these things, it's happened so quickly, guys. I don't know the ages of everyone out there. I have to assume a wide variety of ages. If you're younger, you know, if you're under 35, you do not understand 
what it was like. It was a, a personableness. Now it wasn't all roses, obviously back then. You know, it was a personal. Like my daughter was telling me this. I'm going to put her on blast because I know she's not listening to my show. Because <laughs> <laughs> what little what twenty year old girl is going to sit at home and listen to a talk radio program with her dad on it? <laughs> uh, my daughter was telling me she's like, I was in the parking lot. I thought my friend was in the car down the, you know, a couple cars over. Um, but I couldn't text her for one reason or another. I'm like, well, why didn't you just go knock on the window? It's like, hey. So, well, what if it's not her? It's like, well, you just say, sorry, I thought you were someone else. That's how we handled these things. You know, my daughter is not necessarily a shy person. It's just characteristic of her generation. Like, if I was in a parking lot when I was 20 years old and I thought I saw my friend over, first of all, I would have known because we all had very unique cars back then. <laughs> they didn't all look the same. But I would say, oh, hey, it's it's Eric. And I'd walk over there. If it's not Eric, I'd be like, oh, sorry, I thought you were my friend Eric. You look just like him. And then it's over <laughs> with. You know, younger people have such a hard time with some of this stuff, though. And I don't say that to be mean. It's just a combination of factors. They have lived online, um, you know, for life, basically. I see it now, and this might... This might upset a few people, but I don't I don't understand why there's so many children that are walking around with all these devices and technology. They don't know that this technology exists until you give it. My daughter didn't know what a uh, McDonald's was until she was like six years old. I'm like, I don't have to tell her McDonald's exists. She doesn't know. We didn't have TV like, you know, necessarily back then like we do now either. You know, she was watching videotapes and stuff. It could be like if you've ever seen that movie, The Village, like I could tell her if you have a child. They could think it's like uh, 1860 for all you know. You don't have to – just because we're living in the modern world doesn't mean you have to provide an infant with the latest iWatch or whatever. You know, say, oh, this is a book. Yeah, that's all we got. You know, but I think the sad part is most most adults are not readers anymore, and they can't tear themselves away from the technology. Oh, it's uh, it's addictive for sure. It is, and I don't I don't mean to, uh, to lecture. You know, it's not – but – back to metaphysics, if you're going to become a self-actualized person, uh, and this is this is what it took me all these years to get to. Remember 2004 when I found the Seth material, that's almost 20 years ago now? Yeah. Somehow? And that's so, crazy. Right. That's almost 20 years ago. Uh, soon I will be almost as old as Uncle Frank was when he died. You know, so it's a, there's obviously symbolism in all of that. And I'm in fantastic shape. I'm still attempting to self-actualize based on the Seth material. It's an ongoing process. Uh, but if you're on the metaphysical path, I don't see how you can do that and just be clicking away at devices all the time. You know, and I'm going to kind of, you know, it, it's about what you allow into your mind. And I know you that maybe pe people think that they have a lot more control over their mind than they actually do. You know, I've spent some time in jail, as you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, you know, both of us have been very open about that. Not for anything serious. I was just an alcoholic when I got out of the Air Force, like many other veterans out there. And I found out, despite the good game society talks about helping returning veterans, there was quite a lot lacking in that department. I was not pleased with the VA, we'll say. Well, that yeah, when you came back, also the the whole expectation of the world versus, but you know, to come back to what you're saying too about the the difference in the generations, there's something I realize, you know, uh, with a five year old person who's like, hey, I, I want to figure out what it is like across the world. For us, it was an imagination thing, and then we had to find a society of pen pals to mm -hmm. to actually write a letter to a kid in Australia and figure out what they're doing and tell them about our culture in America. And, you know, I, I sent this kid from Zimbabwe, uh, like a, a dollar, a quarter, a nickel and a dime. I was like, this is our American money. And, and that's how I shared, but a kid can jump on now. Right. You probably sent them a yearly salary. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And on uh, now on the internet, click, click, click. Oh, I can find somebody uh, from Australia. Hey, what's up guys. And no. it's that easy, but on the computer, they're able to do it nice and easy. But in person, I think that's why, there's such a difficulty there with the, and they're used to doing it through the device, through the telephone. Right. I understand all of this and they're not easy questions. And I certainly don't want to sound like I'm moralizing or anything. I just know I, and I think anyone of a certain age knows the, the, how disastrous this can all be. 
Because yes, it, when we were writing finding a pen pal, sure, we couldn't even do the show right now without this technology. And finding a pen pal, though, there is something to be said, something more human of having to, for, you're practicing penmanship, you're writing, you're taking your thoughts from inside and putting them in the physical world. What does anybody say in the metaphysical world? Do you watch The Secret? You read any self-help book from even a crackpot new age metaphysicist? They always say, if you want something to happen, write it down physically with your hand. You're using your body. Now, some people I know have success with voice recorders and typing and things like that. I just think that there is something to be said for you know, physically writing something, having the skill of handwriting, being able to recall how to spell words without them just auto-suggesting to you, um, and then putting it in the mail, and then having to wait and go about your business until the letter's there, and then it's received, and then it's a surprise when it comes back. Like, oh, my friend, and then you might, you know, I get all of that. Yeah, overseas, um, I mean, those letters would take weeks to get over and weeks to get back, so sometimes you wait a month. Right, and it did, and it, it was, um, it develops a type of patience, you know, and that's this is to go back to what I was saying about being in jail. Uh, you know, but people think they have much more control over themselves and their their minds than they actually do, until you find yourself, say, incarcerated, institutionalized, and then you have you're just there with your mind. Then you are forced to be with yourself only. Then see what kind of control you have over your mind. That's that, and and that's not. Um, and it's not just jail either. This has happened if anyone out there is a veteran or um, there's a, a number of experiences you could have had where you've been in a situation like this. When I was in boot camp, no, you, were, you weren't by yourself. They cut you off from all technology, all society. Everything's regimented. They're going to give you a haircut. You're up. You're, you, you know, you, you're, every moment of your day is taken. You have no freedom to do anything. They take all of your freedom from you so you realize how important it is. And so you're like, oh, my God. I'm drinking a can of soda. You know, ask any veteran about this phenomenon. They, they understand because it was stripped from them. If you've been in, imprisoned, institutionalized, any of these things, to, to have to deal with what just goes on in your mind is a very different experience than allowing yourself to be distracted by all the technology. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge, huge difference in uh, the, the sensation of, of being free and thinking you're free. And not exactly. knowing the difference. Right. And it's all, um, you know, as far as metaphysics, that's that's the one thing that I think goes missing from our community sometimes is it, all well-intentioned, all well-intentioned. The one tenet that seems to get forgotten is that all reality comes out of yourself. The, the reality that you experience is your own personal reality and kaleidoscopes around you so that based on how you're feeling, you meet certain versions of different people. Uh, and, and it all is suited perfectly to you. And so if you truly understand that, you wouldn't spend all of your time trying to change other people or by buying into you know, harmful belief systems. The, the, um, the true power of what we can do has not yet been realized, even by myself, even by myself. I catch glimpses of it from time to time, and then I wonder, like, why do I allow myself to get so weighed down in the 3D all the time? If I just, you know if I was just more upbeat and I didn't let things drag me down into that horrible, dense, feel bad reality, I could go even further. You know, I could, I could, um, I could create more of the things that I wanted. Not that I, not that I'm doing bad, certainly not. You know, you, I look back at my life and I'm like, um, you know, like say, say, say catastrophe happens. This is a thing that happened to me earlier this year. All my pipes froze in February. It was a nightmare. I couldn't get a plumber out. I am not necessarily a plumber myself. Well, I replumbed the entire house uh, all by myself. I had help uh, from Amanda and Ariana, mostly. They would hand me wrenches and stuff. But I'm under there. I'm the one in the coveralls. I didn't know how to do it. I had to go buy all this equipment. I couldn't get any plumbers because everyone's pipes had been frozen. And I was miserable the whole time. I was pissed off. I was angry. I was uh, I was cursing. Like I didn't feel like I was getting enough help. You know, I'm like I'm down in this tiny like little casket thing. Uh, you know, because it's a crawl space. Trying to do all this stuff, freezing. My I got blood pouring out of my hands from getting cut, and I'm like just miserably angry. And then at the end, I was thinking to myself like, why? Why? I had to do it anyway. It wasn't going to get done unless I finished it. 
I was the only one that was going to solve my plumbing situation. If I had just felt a little bit better about it, I probably wouldn't have cut myself. I probably would have been done a lot quicker. I probably would, you know, all these other, it could have had so many more positive outcomes because I felt accomplished afterwards. Like, wow, I repumped my entire house. But I also felt bad that, um, or I felt disappointed in myself is a better word. I felt disappointed in myself that I did not do it with a smile on my face the whole time. And of course, that's it's easy to say that in retrospect. You know, when you're going through it, it's not. Well, that's that's the thing. Yeah. Being able to do something like that without having prior experience, it's got to feel rewarding. But also, you know, I, I can imagine you're at a place where you're like, what did I do to create that <laughs> afterwards? You know, retrospectively, maybe even in the moment. Exactly. Exactly. You know, the, all those things are going through it. And that's another thing about metaphysics and creating your own reality is that sometimes, you know, if you are taking responsibility for everything that happens, uh, people can get down on themselves like me. You know, if I had just been doing X, Y, and Z, I wouldn't have wound up in this situation. So I don't think the the answer is in blaming yourself. I think it's more like reflecting on yourself. Well, uh, that's the whole principle of, of the, you know, why did this happen? This is bad. I've been trying to do good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Also brings the question, what will this experience bring me when I'm done with it? And that's the thing we can't always ask ourselves when we're in that moment because we're emotionally raw. We have a mm. story to the thing. We're connected to the thing. Um, so it's not so easy to ask that. But have you found most of these things in your life that were uh, small catastrophes, the huge ones? Um, did they ever give you uh, something? Did they ever teach you something? Did they ever uh, brighten your life up in some way? Always. Always. That's the... Um... That's the thing to keep in mind. That's exactly what I'm saying is like, I know from years of metaphysical experience and just living life that when I'm in a good mood, everything works out much better when I'm not, when I do things the easiest way possible. You've known on when we do Patreon before, I've sometimes shown this documentary about the philosophy of do easy. Oh yeah. A short, short story by William S. Burroughs. Um, and that, that's really it. If you can do something in the most relaxed, easiest way possible, it will get done the most efficient, quickest way possible with the best possible outcome. I know this, you know, but when your hands are bleeding and you're freezing and you can't even take a hot shower and no one's coming to save you, we don't have city water. We have a well, you know, no, there's no, there's no water department that's going to come fix it for me. There's no, there's no plumber that's available. I don't know if they could even have gotten down the road to do it. You know, so once you, the Marines have this, uh, not, I wasn't a Marine. My father was, though. the Marines have this idea that you must be the instrument of your own salvation, which I think is a wonderful idea. And, and it's one that doesn't go around much more, you know, so to bring it back to that overarching point is when you take responsibility for yourself and do it in a positive way, like that's, that's really the best you can get out of life. And the challenge then is when you're down there freezing your ass off in a little confined casket like crawl space is to remember like, yo, I have a lot of reasons that I should be happy about this. You know, and, that, and that's the challenge. That is literally the hardest part of life, actually, is just getting over those moments. You know, the, the catastrophes that happen, you know, usually you can respond to those. You just automatically start responding to a catastrophe. But, you know, to, to overcome these little tiny moments of anger like that's that's what's really difficult well the catastrophes come and go pretty quickly you know usually even though uh the ripple effect like the flood for us um took several months i mean even in some ways we're still not fully full from that experience but that happened in a matter of an hour and an hour and a half it was done you know what i mean Right, But the effects of how I dealt with that, how I felt about it, how I reacted to it, how I co-created with other people, that's that's the part that ended up creating uh, a, a lot of different paths. Some of them were amazing and some of them uh, weren't so great. And so the ones that weren't great, I still learned from. Uh, so those were good, too. And, and this is something I want to talk to you about. Self-creation, creationism, this is a big thing. And there's two topics I want to cover on this with you because you have a, a good grip on the understandings of, of metaphysics enough to help other people maybe understand from your perspective. Um, first of all, what's the difference with creation and, and co-creation? How do those dynamics play out differently from your understanding? 
Well, that is a very profound, interesting question, Rob, because co-creation would be where you talk to the audience for a second while I fill up my coffee cup. And then I'll tell you about <laughs> creation in a second. After you're done with that. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, a, that's a good idea. Uh, so I wanted to say hi to everybody in the chat room, too. I see all of you guys chatting from the uh, Matrix Minds and uh, over on the ET Whisper. So uh, hello, guys. And if any of you did not hear, um, when talking about McDonald's earlier, when William told his McDonald's story, it brought mm -hmm. to mind a very prolific song about McDonald's written by one of the greatest uh, jingle writers I know. Uh Rest in peace, Wesley, Wesley Willis. Willis. Wesley uh, Willis. So enjoy that in, in the uh, chat. I just shared it again. <laughs> so, okay, so co-creation is when you get coffee, and I, I talk to everyone. So what's creation then? <laughs> well, no, that's well. when I do your show, I have a system set up where I can sneak away and get coffee, and no one's any the wiser, but I realized that wouldn't work tonight, so I just had to. Yeah, you're in the fire seat. So <laughs> Right. So, um well, actually, this is a profound question, and I, again, I'm going to defer to the Seth material as my – that's really been my foundation in all of this. Uh, it, the Seth material itself is so raw. I've never seen a body of material that talk, that is so stripped of dogma, and it's just the raw mechanics of how existence works. It's almost too technical. It reads like stereo instructions, some would say. If you remember in Beetlejuice, <laughs> I don't know if you remember where they got the hand after they died, they got a handbook. <laughs> they got, the, like, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a uh, handbook for the recently deceased. Yes, that's it. And that was actually uh, great. And the lady said it reads like radio instructions. The, yeah, the wife, I think. Yeah. So no, some of this, and the Seth material can actually be like that because it's, it's so it's so technical. Um, Seth did this book called The Individual and the Nature of Mass Events which I actually, I read at length when that event happened in the year 2020 that we can't talk about on certain video hosting platforms. You remember the toilet paper thing in 2020. Yeah. Well, Seth has, what's that? Oh, oh no, I was just going to say, uh, I, I was going to ruin the surprise. So I'm going to shut down until you explain what you did with that book. Oh, what I did. Yes. What I did with that book is I went through, the whole premise of the book is how the individual interacts with other members of the collective to form mass realities, such as viruses, the overthrow of governments, pandemics, um, uh, the birth of new religions, social change, you know, how like so. So right now, something that would be going on, we're all living in a reality where there were fires in Maui, you know, caused by one thing or another. So that is a mass reality that we're all part of. If that is aware in your, there are an infinite number of other realities where Maui's doing just fine. And there are people that are experiencing that reality. So this book goes in and it's a very complex subject, as you can tell from just the short example I've given you, it's, it's a big concept to get your head around. So um, one of the things that a collective could create would be such a thing as a mass pandemic. So in that book, Seth spends a lot of time, talking about the body, its natural defenses, its illness, uh, it, its um, its relationship to illness, how it creates its own illnesses, the consciousness of viruses and the purposes that they serve and the, the awareness that they themselves have, and how uh, individuals will join a collective that is involved in such a thing for, for various reasons. The individuals have their own purposes for being part of such an event. Uh, but also the collective, it's making a mass statement, either about living conditions or the, the freedoms that we have or freedoms that we don't have, so that in one way it's serving the needs of the individuals involved in that situation while also making a mass statement, which the collective recognizes at least on a subconscious level. Yeah, that was one of the most interesting things is that people who die in plagues and pandemics uh, are basically Seth described it as a mass suicide as, um, you know, a exclamation to the collective. Hey, we need to fix this stuff. Right. Deaths of protest. Deaths of the protest. Yes. Uh, right. They talked about the plague and how after the plague happened, the modern living life of the serves 
uh, of of the knaves. Uh, sorry, the the Peasantry. common people. Yeah, right. they were the ones who automatically had their life uh, lengthened in time of life. They had cleaning environments because they knew if you don't keep things clean, the plague will kill all of us. And and they knew it wasn't going to discern from a poor person to rich. So the rich started spending money to get the poor fixed up so that everyone could live. And that right. was a that was the purpose behind all those people dying. Like, hey, stop ignoring the people who can't eat. Right. And and the different things like that happen, you know, whether it be wars, it's to draw the collective's attention. And I believe Daryl Anka said something like this uh, to an effect of this. When things when horrible things happen or things that we perceive as horrible, it's a wake up call to the collective. Like, hey, this is the path you've been going down with your beliefs about reality. Do you want to keep going down this path? Because this is what's happening if you do. Yep. Yep. That, exactly. And I always thought that was fascinating. And you took ex, uh, little excerpts from this book uh, and you shared them on an audio recording. And it's one that I actually have uploaded on my YouTube channel also. Yes, because um, you still have a YouTube channel, unlike me. Yeah. yeah. So I guess that's the only place to see it now or Odyssey. Or Odyssey. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. spreading a message of hate, apparently. And so they took down my YouTube channel again. Yeah, yeah, I actually went to click on the link in the description from the last one with your channel. And, and it had a very nice message about why they shut you down. Right. If you um, know this person in real life, please call the authorities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let them, let them know the address and, and the picture. But uh, yeah. Well, the, that's another thing, actually, uh, not to we'll, we'll, I keep your question in mind. That social credit stuff can be a thing too, you know? So you might click on that link one day and now that you're going to be in a database, oh, Rob Gauthier knows William Stowell, you know, and there could be a message here. Like this is a prohibited link. You've, you know, now you've been deducted for social credits. <laughs> well, I mean, the, oh, they are laugh, doing things like that right now. You know, you remember the last time you laughed at me in 2019 when I said I was afraid of mobs of people? Yeah. You're like, oh, when would that happen? <laughs> Yeah, I actually so made laugh a at me. post about that. Yeah, China is doing the, the social credit score thing. You know, you say enough of the wrong things, you're not going to be able to get out of your house that week. Yeah. The government, you know, that's um, that's real, my friend. The technology is terrifying in that regard. So what were you going to say before I interrupted you? Uh, I, I can't remember. Um, but We're I, talking I, about the excerpts. You got the video link there. Oh, and, yeah. No, I was just going to say the 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 video that you did brought a lot of light to uh, the information about why collectives do things in the co-creation. So uh, the second thing I wanted to talk to you about, too, was creation, because you always try to get people, hey, just you, you can create something for yourself. And you started uh, the most uh, either first or second biggest private owned ATM company in Virginia, and it's highly successful. And this is something that a lot of people in our community want to do. This is the reason why they come into Metafix. They hear you can attract what you want. Well, I want money. I want to live well. I want to be rich. And so that's a very big draw in our community. And although I think there's not a ton of people who who work with that energy that are are uh, actually doing it for the right reasons, like to help people more so just to, you know, flaunt secondhand information so that they can do things for themselves. What's the energy behind that? How was the success? Because you didn't start the ATM company as a very rich man or a relative of a rich man. Oh, no, no. I was looking at 10 years in prison. I was, um, I was an alcoholic working at the social security administration. I was a government clerk, basically. My father had just died a few years prior. The VA medical center killed him. And before he died, we were doing tree work, you know, and he was my partner and my dad, you know, so you could imagine how this might upset me. Um, you know, but even that, when it, the, the VA definitely killed dad through a medical mistake, okay? He, uh, uh, they cut his nose off. It was a ghastly, it was a ghastly scene. It get a tracheotomy. Apparently he beat the cancer, but they sent them home. Remember, we live way out in the middle of nowhere. They forgot to give him a suction machine for his tracheotomy site. So he drowned in his own mucus and just died right in front of us. And because he had no nose and a hole in his throat, there's nothing. We couldn't even act to save him. You know, so, yeah, the VA killed him. Now, knowing what I know about metaphysics, the real leap for people is that is just the physical camouflage of how my father chose to die. He was done. He was out. 
one of the things I know for sure, nobody dies by accident. Seth says this very strongly, no death comes unbidden. No one will die who is not ready to die. You know, and so that's a hard pill to swallow because often, obviously, children die and things like that. Well, if you actually, I would encourage you guys to listen to the excerpt. If Rob's going to put the link out there for you, the reading I did of the individual nature. I'm actually of pasting it as you speak. Okay, excellent. Because it deals with these very difficult topics like, you know, why did my child die? Well, you know, perhaps it was an entity. Now, you have to remember, even though we see these creatures as little innocent babies, like helpless, the consciousness in it is millennia old, you know, the consciousness that we possess existed before time itself even began. So we are timeless creature. Yes, our human self sees this helpless little creature, and rightly so, and we want to help it. Uh, Seth says that, well, maybe this is a consciousness that just wanted to experience a small portion of physical life. It wasn't ready for the whole thing. It wanted to dip its toe in to physical life on earth. And the mother was a consciousness that agreed to have it. maybe wanted to experience childbirth and early infancy. And then the losing of the child propels the mother onto her greatest, uh, her, her greatest development, shall we say. You know, that's something else. I don't know if it's American because I don't get out of the country um, these days. It, it, tragedy, like, if you really think about it and you're not a sad sap, like the most horrible things that have happened to you Oh, what made you who you are? You know, like, uh, like Rob, you wouldn't be the ET whisperer without all the horror that happened to your son and everything else along the way. Oh, absolutely. There's a, a thousand percent guarantee on, on that. And I actually talked about that with Ruben quite in depth about some of the things uh, that were tough that I went through um, on his last uh, interview with me over on the interview with extra dimensional portal, he meets weekly and, and interviews people. And I did his interview just a few days ago. Yeah. Uh, right. It's very true without any of that experience, it wouldn't have built the character for me to be who I was for sure. Right. You know, so at the surface level, the VA killed my father. That's what, that's, that's how it went out. Um, that was, that was his exit opportunity. I know. Cause I, you know, I'm a lucid dreamer. I'm a channeler myself. I have had con conversations with him since he has died. I know he still exists. There's no question in my mind he still exists. The physical death, someone just said, phys I forgot where I heard it. I hate to just rip people off so blatantly, but I don't remember. You know, you get involved for metaphysics for so long, you don't remember who says what. I am merely a vessel of the information, as we all are. Uh, somebody said that physical death is just a change of address. So apologies to whoever. <laughs> I like that. You know, so it's really, it was really my father's choice. And then with my father dying, well, then I had to become a real man, you know, like a real, real man. You're like, now dad's not coming when I get a flat tire. Dad's not going to have an extra $60 for me when I can't make the power bill. Dad's not going to be there to help me get firewood for the winter. You know, yes, all very horrible things. Now I am infinitely more capable than I ever would have been if he was still here, which is hard to admit. Human beings don't like to say goodbye. Like, oh no, it'll be, you know, it's, you know, like after he died, it's like, wow, man, I, you know, if I only had known he was going to, we all do this. If I only knew he was going to die, I would have made that phone call. I would have been there. Well, you know, chances are you wouldn't. People get so caught up in their own lives and that's the reality of it. You know, you things take you around. We, you know, you, you were here and there, and uh, one day we're not. You know, so that people go, let them go gracefully, and learn from it what you can. It's a very tough pill to swallow, especially when it's a child or unexpectedly. I get all of that, you know. But if you're really on the metaphysical path, these are some of the tenets of what we believe. I would say, you know, not like it's a, a religion or anything like that. Um, so anyway, to get back to your question about the ATM business, about creating reality, I was as this this is this is plays right into that directly. I was about as low as you could go. Uh, my they had just killed my father, even though I knew on a on another level that it was it was time for him to go. Um, I had become I, I couldn't do tree work really anymore because I didn't have anyone that I could really trust. I was you know you can't really do it on your own. So I started taking these jobs as government clerk from when I was in the military. I get veterans preference points for being in there. And uh, I become a drunk. I start seeing some of the um, – this is like my third major bout of alcoholism when I'm working at Social Security. It was like Miss Lonely Hearts, just the saddest stories in the world. And I couldn't deal with it. 
And I was thinking to myself, like, man, if I just had an out, if I just had some, I need something else. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get anywhere working for the government. I'm, you know, drinking heavily. And the delicatessen across the street, I went in there one day, and the guy's like, man, I wish I had an ATM. You know, all these people come over with their government benefits. They'll buy like a soda or a sandwich, and then they want like eighty or a hundred dollars back. And I'm like, I'll get you an ATM, dude. I didn't even know that that was possible. I was talking out my <laughs> no. I was talking out my ass completely. I had no. I just said it. Well, since I'm a government worker, when I went back to the office, I just spent the rest of the afternoon checking out ATM prices on the internet because no one will actually stop you from doing that because we have some of the most unproductive governments around. I'm telling you guys, I spent so much time working for the government. Some of the worst things I've seen done to people the VA or the Social Security Administration was doing to veterans and citizens. That's another story. Yeah, that's that's a harsh reality, too, to, to look at. But it's probably something you needed, too, to get you boosted out of there. Right. Well, once the collective sees how these bureaucracies are treating us, you're going to we're all in a very short order, I think, mark my words, going to have to reach in, especially those of us in America and say, is this the system we want to continue to create or do we want to create a new reality? That is definitely coming, my friends. So I went back to work and I squandered the afternoon checking out ATMs. I found one. It was um, like, I think I paid $3,600 for it. I had to stop paying my bills for three months. They turned my power out. I had no, I bought it. I believed in this. I was delusional. I'm like, oh, surely I could make $100 a day doing this. Not with one, you can, but not necessarily with one ATM. I made $12 my first month in business. But so, <laughs> I, right. <laughs> so I bought this ATM, like, and then right before it ends up getting delivered, I get busted for my third DUI. Obviously, I, you know, I don't want to say I'm ashamed. I wish it hadn't happened in a sense. You know, drinking and driving is never okay, really. It's, you know, but it did happen. Um, and I was drunk. I didn't even realize I was driving. You know, when you get so far into these things, you don't even understand the decisions you're making, which is terrifying. This is what I talk more about being present in your body and using your consciousness. You know, if you're zonked out on prescription drugs all the time or, or anything that you use, I'm not saying don't use these things. I'm just saying if you start using them to excess, if you start using them as escapism, you know what, what too much is. You know, partying is one thing, but, you know, dependency is something else entirely. Yeah, it's a chemical crutch type deal. Right, and I think you know the difference out there. Um, if you can quit anytime you want to and you still haven't quit, it means you can't quit anytime you want. But um, so I end up getting picked up for my third DUI, and they give me an option like, well, you can go to rehab at the VA since you're obviously a troubled veteran, you know, which was miserable because the VA was built in the night, like 1932 under the WPA and Roosevelt. And it looked like it was, it was like hell. It was, it was like, it looked like one of these places where they were going to lobotomize you at any moment. Like some God. real one flew over. Yeah. It was like, it was a VA hospital from 1932. Like, what do you think? It's, um, you know, so I went along with that. And then I didn't want the people that I sold the ATM to, to realize that I had just been apprehended for felony DUI. So I, uh, I was running the whole business from a telephone booth at the VA. They, I told them I was at a leadership retreat, you know, like a leadership conference. Cause I didn't want them to know I was really in rehab at a government hospital. And, uh, <laughs> It worked out. I had some, uh, fortunately, I had some family members that were willing to help me out. We had $80 to start because you have to put your own money in the ATM or find a company to do it for you. We had $80 to put in the ATM. And as quick as it would come out, we'd get it back and have to put it back in there. You know, and, and so now, yes, now we're doing quite well. I've got some of the best, I've got some of the best convenience stores around, hotels, you know, but it, I, I didn't allow myself to be demoralized. And there were so many reasons I could have been demoralized. I didn't know why. I just knew I had to go along with this. After making $12, I didn't, I haven't, I started this business in 2015. I haven't been making real money except for like the past two and a half, three years. You know, it was a slow going. Um, but you had mentioned earlier that many people get into metaphysics because they're like, well, if I can create whatever I want, I, mean, I can certainly create money. And this you can, in fact, do. One of, and I've, I've come from real poverty and at some point in the near future, another year or two, I'm going to be owning my own credit union. 
with a um, a collective of friends of mine. So I am, you know, by any capitalistic definition, a success in that regard. And I will tell you probably exactly what you don't want to hear. Money is actually not the answer. It's very important. And I want to accumulate as much of it as I can. I've learned along the way that time is really the ultimate wealth, you know, because I know so many people, I, I rub elbows with multimillionaires now and um, they're not what you think they are. Like, yeah, surely, yeah, there's some people out there that are just multimillionaires and they're flashy and they're living the good life all the time. I know quite a few millionaires or close to it. And when I see them, they're usually always holding a mop, cleaning out a soda fountain machine, fixing a vending washing machine at their laundromat. They are actively involved in their business. They're driving all old dumpy cars. Yeah, I drive a 1992 Oldsmobile. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not going to, none of them that I know buy new cars. Like none of them, there's not one person I know that has a brand new car. Well, uh, that's that says something to too how you become a millionaire. You don't blow all your money as soon as you get it. <laughs> you know, right? When I when I um, like the the picture you have up on the screen of me in this in this suit. I'm wearing a suit here. I'm actually in the Trump Hotel in Washington D.C. Uh, many years ago, and in my mind, like when I became a success, like that's what I would be doing. Well, no, I'm in a suit here because I'm running for sheriff at this time period, and we're at a political type event. You know. Uh, now I'm wealthier than I've ever been. And your chances are I'm going to be in a, a tank top and a pair of jeans crawling through a drop ceiling, running ethernet cable, you know, or, or driving like 16 hours a day to go somewhere and put receipt paper in or something like that. You know, so yeah, I've got the money now and now it's a, the opportunity to get your time back. So yes, your time is the ultimate wealth. Money does not solve all the problems, although I don't want to downplay it because that's, I'm going to say something now. It's going to sound exactly the opposite of what I was just saying. In our community, there is definitely, definitely, definitely a prevailing belief system that money is bad and somehow we would be all better without it. And we're just going to go back to bartering shit. And it's going to be cool because we're not going to have banks and things like that. And that's that's a delusion. I cannot. I was just talking. Actually, I was just talking to a millionaire earlier before I got on the air with you tonight. One of them. My good friend now, he I have many ATMs in many of his convenience stores. And uh, we were talking about how money is the best possible way to exchange your labor and your goods and your time. You know, because I've bartered in the past. Remember, I do tree work and I have traded firewood to people for various services. You can only get so far with that. Like eventually, you know, you're not people aren't going to need all this firewood. I can't go to my grocery store with a quart of firewood and say, yo, here. Uh, and maybe you think it should be like that, but it's far easier to be like to take your creativity. If you have a skill or a service or a product that you can provide that you can do better than anyone else. And here's a hint for those of you out there trying to uh, achieve success. Whatever you're going to make the most money in is something that you enjoy doing anyway, something you're already passionate about. If you're making money doing something that you're not happy doing, yes, you may be getting the money, but that's not. You know, that, that that's not what you're looking for either. Well, money can't buy happiness. That's that whole routine right there. If you're going to be happy doing what you're doing and being able to do that and making money, I mean, that's the that's the actual win in life. Right. And that, that that's exactly the thing. If you're trying to make it, you know, if you guys are out there and you want to um, you want to come up, so to speak, whatever talent you have, something that you love doing already. Do that and do it because you love it and find out a way to market it. And it may not take off right away. As long as you don't give up, something will happen. Actually, here's, here's a quote. This is a mantra that I meant to tell you earlier. This is one I can attribute. Um, I go see the Pleiadians channeled by Barbara Marciniak. She does her events in Raleigh uh, every month. And I go down there. And there is this mantra that the Pleiadians have put out. Everything is going to work out better than I can possibly imagine it. Everything's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out, but it's going to work out better than you can possibly imagine. You're always going to be in the right place at the right time, meet the right people. And as long as you have to believe that, you just keep saying it over and over. Everything's going to work out better than I can imagine. I don't know how it's going to work out, but it's going to. I'm going to meet the right people at the right time. I'm going to be in the right place at the right time. And that's the thing. That's the, the trust you have to. This is an acquired skill, trusting the universe. You know, so... Um, 
Yeah, money money is not all bad. That this goes back to the belief system that we have. Like they say that money's the root of all evil. The, I think these are horrible belief systems to have. You know, you t- there is no there is nothing wrong with creating your own abundance. That that is the only way you can help other people. And it's not necessarily like, "Oh, I'm going to get money and just give it out." It's not going to be like that. Once you are abundant and you're able to do things for people, um you can't you can't help anybody if you know if you're struggling to fill your own gas tank you know necessarily you know once you have your own abundance like genuine true abundance and not necessarily financial that inner abundance the real feeling of abundance that everything's going to be okay um even if you don't and i know people like this also that they don't um they don't accumulate wealth at all they just always have what they need they know they're always going to get a meal somehow or another a day. They know they're always going to have a place to sleep. So even though they don't own a home, they don't rent, they don't have an address. Ostensibly, they're homeless. They're happy. Not all homeless people are happy. Some, some of these people I know, because the Appalachian Trail runs right through here, and you see some of these people, uh, they just wing it, and things work out for them. And you know, sometimes they might uh, they might be caught in a downpour, and things might be going really bad, and they're shivering and cold and sick. But that is a price that they are willing to pay in their reality for the freedom of being a wanderer, essentially. Yeah, I I have seen a lot of people have that type of abundance where it's not, hey, I I'm rich and overflowing with money. Uh, I don't own my own business that's successful, but people who are, always have exactly what they need. And uh, my dad used to attribute part of that to his faith. You know, um, he had some family that uh, was broke in the military and they couldn't get any rations or anything like that. So dad just went over and gave him the groceries that he had. And, and my mom's freaking out like, what are you, you know, and he said, God will provide. Well, he, he actually trusted that. He trusted it. And that same night, uh, a friend brings over several packages of, of uh, uh, animal that they had had slaughtered. And, hey, here, here you go. Here's about six months worth of meat. And boom. Right. You know what I mean? So that happens in the play out for trust. And, you know, the Christianity ex- ex- expunges that faith uh, into uh, some form of uh, God or something like that. But honestly, it, it's the same principle, trusting the universe, trusting yourself to create it. Right. And well, you know, you talk about sociology also and belief. One of the things when I was getting my undergraduate degree, I studied, um, there's a wonderful book out there actually called uh, Salvation on Sand Mountain. I can't remember the author right now. I've got it behind me, but it's just out of reach. Uh, it, it was a case, it was a snake handling church in Tennessee and the pastor tried to kill his wife with poisonous snakes. He was going to make it look like it was a, a mishap, you know, but he was going to murder her. Well, she ends up living. And then this journalist goes down there to study it. Cause you know, he's going to sensationalize it. He's like, wow, this is a really crazy story. You know, these weirdos handling snakes, you know, there's murders going on down here and the drinking poison and handling snakes. And like, wow, well, it's pretty wacky. Well, what he found was a people of an incredible faith. There was nothing wacky about it. Um, the, they, these people, um, they take a, a version. I think it's a verse from the Bible in the book of Timothy. They take it very literally about handling serpents and drinking poison. And in a sense, you know, far from being wacky, like these are people willing to put their money where their mouth is, you know, so they're like, uh, you know, not to diminish you out there if you're not handling snakes and drinking poison, but these people, you could tell they stand by their faith. You know, you could call them a lot of things, but you can't call them a sellout or a poser because they're, and um, they get many of them get bitten by snakes, poisonous snakes, and drink poison, and they're just fine. You know, yes, a couple of them die here. That is so rare when you actually look into it. And of course, you just hear about that, like another snake handling nut died. Well, most of them don't. Their belief is that strong. You know, they have um, uh, a- an inherent trust in the universe that they call God. Treb, Treb talked about uh, a tribe or, or a group of people in India. Um, oh, the mercury people. Yeah, that they, they eat thermometers and they drink mercury, and that's supposed to kill you. But he said that's that's the high possibility of having true belief systems. 
like investment 100%. And the way that he always described it and RNF is like reality is like a, a computer program. And what trust is or faith or belief in something, that's the parameter of the program. So nothing you don't believe in can come in. Nothing you do believe in can go out unless you have uh, something, some kind of uh, deviation from that trust. So it, let's say... I don't believe UFOs exist. I'm 95% sure. Well, you have 5% opportunity to still see UFOs. And that's how a lot of people do it through that very thick belief. And then um, there's another uh, aspect of that belief system. It's the incorporation of, of experiences and thoughts and holding on to time and not being present in that now moment. So say, you know, I believe I can't make money because I've tried and I've failed miserably. And see, I've proven it to myself over and over and over again, detaching yourself from the old stories, too. So I think that's a big reason why I brought up that that financial thing. How much of this was just sheer belief? How much of it was crazy luck, as some people say it? And how much of it was manifestation? You know, when when you look down to the brass tacks of it, you were doing all those things you needed to manifest that without necessarily knowing that you could manifest that or how to manifest that. Right. Well, I, I always believed in the idea. You know, the thing is that I learned along the way, and this is that trust part again, guys, is that uh, in the beginning, well, I didn't ha really have a lot of money. I, I felt like a fraud. Like I got an ATM and a delicatessen that I can barely keep $80 in. <laughs> you know, like it gets cleaned out constantly. But I get I get make the money from the surcharge. I get paid, so I'm always accumulating just a little bit more money, cobbling it together. Well, now I got a hundred dollars to put in the machine. Well, now I got a hundred and ten dollars to put in the machine. You know, and it's been years of doing that. Uh, How many times I, a day did you have to go fill that? Uh, at well, first? at the time, I could only go fill it once every day because I'd have to wait till the money came back in the bank. Then I, once they take it out of the ATM, the only way I get it back is through a series of processors. The money comes back. It gets debited from the, the person's account who uses the machine. And it winds see. up back in the account tied to the ATM. You know, that's how you get the money back. Otherwise, people would just clean your ATM out. And you'd never get your money back. <laughs> right, right. So I, I would have to wait the next day. And I, whatever I got back, I'd take it out of the bank and I would put it back in as quickly as possible, as soon as I, as quick as I could make the drive. And uh, but I was worried because I felt like I don't have a lot of money. I felt like a fraud. I was always worried about running out of money. So guess what happened? I was always running out of money, <laughs> you know, and it's so obvious when you think about it that way. This is I, I don't want to get down on the listeners or the, the new age audience or the, the metaphysical group. There are prevailing conflicts of belief. There's a cognitive dissonance in our movement if you could call it that, or our, I don't know what you'd call what we do here because we're each on our own spiritual path um, where people say, well, I would love to be wealthy. I'd love to have money. And then they have a bunch of horrible beliefs about money. Wish it didn't exist. People that have money are dirt bags. Actually, Bashar talked about that in the documentary tuning in how you set yourself up for great torment when you're like, people that have money are bad, but I want money. You know, and that's, <laughs> that's a conflicting belief that goes unexamined in most people. Uh, and it's the same thing, you know, you and I did a very, very interesting uh, Patreon program with Metatron. Where, where we, oh, yeah. When we're talking about the Earth, you know, how could we be more in harmony with the Earth? And he spent in the entire time dismissing the fact that the Earth is just some fragile, helpless creature that human beings are destroying simply by being here. In our community, there are so many twisted beliefs about the Earth um, which I'm going to summarize here a little bit. If you recognize any of these, please believe something else because it will be benefit that the earth is somehow uh, threatened by us, and that human beings are an abomination on the planet, that we're, you know, the Catholics would say that you're damned, that you have original sin just by being born, that we're somehow a, a virus to the planet, that we're somehow evil to the planet, and that, you know, uh, the earth would be better off without us. And you, I don't know that everybody could access that if they weren't on Patreon. That was a very, very good program because uh, Metatron came out and he's like, you know, you're all a part of the earth. Most of the earth's consciousness is human consciousness simply because of the sheer number of beings that travel through it. Uh, whatever you're doing to the earth, the earth needs in some way, even things that look, you know, horribly bad sometimes from a human perspective, the earth can respond to. 
you know, it's not some some whimpering, fragile uh, eggshell that we're going to destroy just by being on it. Could we treat it better? Yes, absolutely. And always, we're not getting the true relationship with the earth that we could be having. But we're certainly, essentially, it's the height of arrogance to think that somehow we ourselves could destroy the planet. You know, the earth, uh, the earth will always exist. And Metatron went on to talk about how the earth was the most sophisticated piece of technology in any universe was the, the planet earth. Oh, absolutely. And, and the, the energy uh, around that too, it, it reminded me how much we blame uh, other factors for the things that we do and how much we think that we can impact the earth too. And those are both conflicting beliefs also, you know what I mean? Um, I, I really did enjoy that that channeling, and I think you're right. I think that was just a Patreon thing, but I, I did pour a couple clips into YouTube. I'll have to look at that and check for some more. It's a very good. It's essential because you know to get back to my main point, if you can if you can create whatever reality you want, and you truly can, why would you believe that we're harming the Earth? Like that itself is harming the Earth. You know uh, the the human, um, and Seth had said this also. The human being is the thinking, conscious, aware portion of the earth. As they say in the Bible, we are truly the stewards of the planet. So a more productive belief system would be that you are a caretaker of the planet, regardless of what human beings around you are doing. Regardless of what you mean, you can only take responsible responsibility for yourself, regardless of what other human beings are doing. I am a steward of the planet. I saved the spider today. There was a spider in my living room. I put a mason jar over it and I put like a little thing under it and I took it outside. You know, I am a caretaker of the planet. You know, nature is happy that I am here. Nature is, we are part of a willing, uh, a willing cooperative effort with the planet. The earth needs us to be here. The earth enjoys the fact that we are here. If you're going around believing that we're harming the earth, or we're destroying the earth, you know, that's that you're creating that reality. That is exactly the reality you're creating. And we gave the example, some of you might remember, of course, the BP oil spill that happened, I think it was 2006 or something like that. It was just raw oil just pouring into the ocean from a burst underground pipe. And they were catastrophizing that. They were, well, it's, it's going to ruin everything for years and destroy the coral reefs and we will never recover from this. I think it was less than uh, five, six weeks or something like that. The earth has a type of bacteria that feasts on that type of petroleum product and neutralizes it. And so what did the earth do? The earth responded. They flooded this area with this particular type of bacteria, took care of it, no problem. The, L the earth is a self-healing, self-correcting system. We forget that so often. And it is the height of arrogance to think that somehow we are going to destroy the very supremely aware Mother Earth. It's not, well, it's not well, in the cards. Well, think about the oil response. You and I were both old enough to remember what, that experience and what happened. A lot of people were worried and it's like, oh my God, I wish I could do something to help. And I, I want to be helpful, you know, oh my God, bring awareness to this. So through their own catastrophizing through the news, it brought awareness, which also the earth reads. Mm -hmm. Metatron also said, I am an actual creator in, in the literal sense. When the winds blow, I'm related to that. When the water turns, I'm related to that. But I don't do that from my own will. I read your energy mm -hmm. and you tell me what to do and I do it. Right. Also, that's, again, it, yeah, that's beautiful. Yes. In that Seth book, The Individual and the Nature of Mass Events, it talks very, um, uh, also, I, I didn't put it in the excerpt I did because I, the pandemic was the pressing issue at the time. Um, the parts of the book I didn't read talked about weather patterns, natural disasters, you know, because Rob and Jane were going, Rob, Jane Roberts, the lady who channeled Seth and her husband, Rob, they were going through a flood of their own at the time. And Seth used that as an example, like, well, what's, what's going on in the psyche, the collective psyche of the local community, you know, to be a part of this you know, what's happening right now, what's happening when, you know, when you're uh, in a forest fire or a volcano or an earthquake and Metatron talked about some of this and you can also find if these, if these matters interest you, Rob's channeling with Metatron and the individual in the nature of mass events by Jane Roberts 
are required reading. You know, and so William's I, excerpts for that is in the description. Also, I, I also put it in the description of the video for those of you who listen later. Yes, thank you, Rob. So it's uh, like I said, I don't want to sound like I'm getting down on everybody. It's just that so often in our community, there's this, you know, money's no good. We're hurting the earth. We're bad. Well, how do you expect to, to rise above anything if you've got those attitudes about yourself and the planet you live on? And it may, you know, maybe easier if you live, if you live in nature and in fairness, I usually only see people in urban and suburban areas. You know, if you're living in a city, you're already a few steps removed from nature. Like for me, there's a chance that I'm going to drive past a cow that I'll end up eating literally because the, the beef farm is only like a mile from my house. So you just go there. It's a family beef farm and you can just buy stuff from them. You know, so you're like, you'll literally drive past the animals. They're right there. It's obvious we're all part of the food chain. We're all creatures. Uh, you know, so the, the point that I was getting at with that is like, if you have these negative beliefs about the earth, your place on the earth, uh, the financial abundance you want, you're not going to achieve those things because there's just too much static out there. Absolutely. Now we're already at uh, an hour 25, almost an hour 26. So let's play the lightning round legitimately. I don't think oh, we God. did this either while you were on there. So. No. What is your favorite color? Oh, God. Well, purple just came to my mind. Uh, it, it changes. It changes. But purple is the first one that came to my mind right now. That's a good one. Um, what is your favorite food? Oh, also that changes. Lately, I've been on a Taco Bell kick. Um, I don't know. New York bagels. It's got to be New York, though. Yeah. Not says New York, but is in Michigan. I've tried. Right. It's got to be. Not... Act oh, my God. Well, the worst is when you go to New Jersey and they say, oh, we got New York bagels, and you know they don't because it's New Jersey. <laughs> All right. So what's your favorite um, song and or band? Uh, Spongle. Spongle is my top band. Uh, that's S-H-P-O-N-G-L-E. I highly recommend if you guys want to, if you like trippy music and good music, look up Spongle live at Red Rocks in 2019. I was at that concert. It's amazing. And Spongle is also an ET Whisper approved band, um, but, but for sure. Um, what is your favorite animal? Mm. Well, a chinchilla is the first thing. I used to have a chinchilla when I was younger. Uh, we They were so soft. I don't know if anyone's ever had a live chinchilla. I hate to say a chinchilla coat because it equally is soft. But the chinchilla takes a dust bath. They've got these. I had a giant pickle jar. It was full of this, like, they call it chinchilla dust. It looks like cocaine. But they would go in there and they roll around at supersonic speed. So it really looks like they're on cocaine because they're just rolling around in this white powder. But they don't take water baths. They take dust baths. And so, you know, when you ask me my favorite animal, although I'm becoming much more fond of one of these cats that I kind of have. That kind of cohabitates with you and runs around and killing animals. Right. I, lo I love cats too. Um, I've never seen, I think I did see a chinchilla before, but I never touched it. Um, and that, that's, those are good. Well, anybody out there, look up a chinchilla taking a dust bath. If you cannot, my friends used to call it the crack weasel because it literally, legitimately, <laughs> it looks like it's just going Tony Montana, Scarface in a, uh, in a pile of cocaine. <laughs> uh, brings back all sorts of eighties type memories for the, yeah. uh, good movie. All right. Um, what is your, favorite uh place that you've gone in nature for both the physical beauty and the energetic feeling of it well that spangle concert was at the red rocks amphitheater right around that part of colorado i was stationed out there when i was in the air force um the garden of the gods it's all very beautiful i can't tell you one favorite place because rio rancho new mexico absolute magic it felt like I was in a dream the entire time I was there in Rio Rancho. Um, and here where I live in Appalachia, you know, it's right now the fall is setting in. In, in, in when I was in Colorado, the Rocky mountains are all snow capped, you know, so they're basically always snow capped mountains pretty much year round out here. They're all covered in trees of different types. Some are evergreen, some are different. So as the seasons change, the mountains change colors and the winter eventually become, you know, barren and snow capped. Yeah, the, the Blue Ridge Parkway is gorgeous in October. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Um, what is 
Um, what is your favorite childhood memory? Last one. Oh, my favorite childhood memory. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it says about me, but when you say that, I started thinking about like all kinds of horrible things that happened to me in childhood. Oh, no. It's had no. that effect on a couple of people, and that's that's the one sensitive question there. Yeah, I remember being at Splish Splash Water Park in Riverhead, Long Island on opening day. It was like 1990, 91. That was one of mine. I remember I had so many good memories, though. That was a that was a particularly momentous day though, because I'm like, yo, I got to go, I got to go to the Splish Splash water park. It's still there too. It's still there. But being and another time at that water park, this is one of the times that you know you talk about me being a sociologist and and into metaphysics and everything. This is one of the times I realized how stupid the collective can be. We were at <laughs> we were at Splish Splash water park, and it started gently, like ever so gently raining. Almost everyone left because they didn't want to get wet at the water park. <laughs> we had almost the whole place to ourselves, you know, and the other brave people that didn't mind being in the rain at the water park. Like, I'm like, I, I remember thinking about, I don't know, I must have been like 11 years old. And I remember thinking to myself, you stupid bastards. Like, literally, <laughs> that's exactly what I thought in my mind. And I didn't even really think like that as an 11 year old. I'm like, why? You know, my father, he kind of looked at me, too, because, he, you know, we always had this kind of knowing. And he's like, yeah, they're leaving because they don't want to get wet. And we just kind of looked at each other like morons. Like, more, you know, you pay like $80 to get in there, even back then for a family of four. Um, and you got to leave because it starts raining. So they, it was it was magic because there was like basically no lines. You go on all the slides you wanted as many times, basically as quick as you could run back to the top of it. Uh, yeah, it was a good time. It was probably a bunch of parents who weren't doing the rides and they were like, oh my God, I'm going to get what? Oh, kids, we got to go. You know how many pissed off kids there were in that place? Not me though. Yeah, but that, that was a, that was a red letter day in my life. Cause I'm like, this, this makes no sense to me. It was actually one of the first times I, re you've helped me remember this, Rob. It was one of the first times I remember seeing people do things like that made no sense that were just totally out of their best interest well that was a two for one you got to do the splash park with yourself uh, pretty much the only uh person there and you got to learn how dumb you was gonna be all at the same time. right it was like you know but, but all the workers were still there and everything we got to go see the parrot show like and all it did was like it was great because you know, the worst part about being at a water park is drying off while you're waiting in line. And now with the rain, that wasn't happening. You know. <laughs> well, that's amazing. We have gone over our 90 minutes. Um, besides the link I shared with everyone on my channel, uh, where can people connect with you? Where can people, how can people find you? Or do you want them to find you? Basically in the phone book. Like that's pretty much the only place you can find me now. No, they've taken down most of my chat. Now you can find me. If you search for Fincastle Underground anywhere, you'll be able to find me. I'm not making content. I will tell you I was making political content. If that's not your flavor, let's just not talk about political content, you know, and just uh, appreciate me for my metaphysical work. And that's something else. That would be another one of my closing messages, guys. You know, when you were younger – or you before the internet, not when I was younger, but before the internet, you know, if you had like a car mechanic, maybe you saw him, you know, once every couple of months for an oil change and like, oh, hey, Joe, my car mechanic, I really like him. Or, you know, my uh, my dry cleaner guy. Well, it's my dry cleaner guy. We have very polite conversation. And I love seeing my dry cleaner guy. Well, now with the internet and everything there, I know that dry cleaner guy is a radical communist and voted for someone that I don't like. And so now I'm not going to ever see the dry cleaning guy the same way again. You know, and so um, what I'm saying, if we want to get along, we're going to have to go back to accepting people for the parts of them that you do enjoy and not just disposing of people because they didn't vote for someone that you didn't vote for or because they see things differently than the way you used to. Years ago, you would never know these parts of people because society was a different. It was structured differently. The Internet you were was told not, to not to tell no one who you voted for or right. how much you made. Or right. religion. Right. You know, and so there was something to that because you, you could have like, oh, it's just my friendly waitress. Well, now because of waitress, my because of Facebook, I know that my friendly waitress believes this thing that I find that I don't necessarily believe. And so now it's kind of soured the relationship. 
well, you know, if you're going to be good at this kind of thing, you should work past that, guys. That would be my my closing messages tonight. I know we've talked a lot of about a lot of different things. I Anybody? want you to make your own content metaphysically. I, I've been trying to get you to do a show for our network forever, and hopefully one day you will because you're you're good at it. You enjoy it. I do enjoy it. You know, but you know what I was saying. What I was saying to you guys tonight is that um, everybody that's on, you know, you think about how you got into this metaphysical nonsense to begin with. Like, oh, I'm going to create my own reality. Maybe you saw the secret. Maybe you you found the channel or something along the way. And you're like, okay, I'm going to get, I need to change this in my life. I'm going to use this new material. And, you know, sometimes it works or you get there in an unexpected way, or sometimes you come to a dead end and you're like, you feel stuck. And what I guess, if I have any metaphysical message to everyone tonight, it's to, you know, start um, examine, really examining your beliefs, even things that are really important and dear to you. Like, why do I believe these things? You know, you look around like, oh man, human beings are, the damaging the earth. Like, how could this not be true? Well, it's up to you to decide that you don't want it to be like that and to decide that you're going to live in a reality where it doesn't happen. And it's that easy. The change that you want to make is literally inside of yourself. You know, if you can believe and create literally anything you want, then do that. And if you find yourself saying, well, it would be nice to do that, you know, but this company's doing that and this person's doing that, then then you've lost because now you're putting your power outside of yourself, you know, taking responsibility for making the change. Like, yeah, I'd love to heal the earth, but Exxon is dumping oil into God, you know. Well, if you if you change your if you change your own personal beliefs, you focus on a, you enter the world that you want to live in. And if you focus on the things you don't want, they are always going to be there. You know, so even though you might feel righteous bitching about some problem, all you're doing is perpetuating it. That is the hardest thing. I hope what I'm saying, I've said it a number of ways. I hope it gets through to you guys out there. If there's things that you don't like, don't focus on them and then they won't be there. Beautiful message, brother. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for being here tonight. And I want to thank all of you guys too for being here tonight. Uh, as you guys know, We'll be here every Wednesday at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern. That's 7 Pacific. Next week, Oriah Mears, uh, the week after on the 13th, Art Geyser. Then our good friend, CM Kosman, And then David Chase. And after that, we'll have Ismail Perez. And we're going to keep going and going and going. So you come here every Wednesday from the Matrix Minds, from the ET Whisperer, from the Enlightenment Evolution Hour, and we'll hang out with you live. And if you want to see it later, enjoy it, guys. And thank you so much, brother, for being here. As always, it's always a treat. Spend time with you, brother, and uh, I'm glad you are able to come tonight and do this. Yes, me too. It was really just an excuse because we hadn't talked for a while. But uh, if you guys, <laughs> if, if you want to hear more of me, uh, you can actually subscribe to Rob on Patreon and come over there. I do host this program twice a month. I don't know that I'll be able to do it tomorrow because I'm going to be at Front Porch Fest in the woods. So making money uh, from ATMs. May, yes, I'm going to I'm going to have to show up, place an ATM, and then walk around the music festival for four days until it's time to pack it up and leave. Um, and I never, <laughs> I never would have thought this was possible, guys. I don't want to keep rolling over Rob's clock here because it is his show. I'm just telling you, if there's something in your life that you don't like and you're hung up on it, it, it really is as easy as, you know, just deciding to move past it. You have just examine it, sit with it for a while and be like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to be available for this. I'm actually going to. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to try something different. I'm going to get up. I'm going to put effort in in a place I've never put effort in before. Like you really can do it. It's just a matter of breaking your routine, guys. Thank you so much, brother. Sorry, it took me a minute to uh, to unmute. I was just thanking everybody in the text. Uh, all right, guys, that's it for the night. I love you all. Thank you again, brother, for being here. Uh, you'll see all of us. Uh, Patreon people who are coming, we will be doing... Uh, our live stream tomorrow between 9 and 10 start time p.m. Eastern. That's either uh, 6 to 7 Pacific. Uh, so keep an eye out on the Patreon for the link for the live stream. I love you guys. We'll see you next week here on the Enlightenment Evolution Hour. And be on the lookout for the second galactic channeling. We're going to start trying to keep those uploads done on Friday. Enjoy, everyone. We love you. 
See you on the other side, guys.